All right, good day. Uh, good day. Uh, this is Worldview, and we have with us two very distinguished geopoliticians and analysts. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you, first of all, uh, John Helmer, uh, who's with Dances with Bears, uh, very, uh, very well uh, versed in Russian affairs, domestic politics and international affairs in Russia. And we have also Matt Eret. Uh, who is the editor and contributor of uh, the Canadian Patriot Patriot Review. And I'm Michael Grabowski. I'm your host. I am a um, Vienna-based journalist and political analyst. Gentlemen, th thank you very much for joining us on our first show, uh, our Worldview show. Welcome to the both of you. Thank you. Thank well, it's a thank pleasure. You, Gentlemen, uh, I'd like to start off with uh, John Helmer. Um, Mr. Helmer, uh, there's been a lot happening in Germany. Uh, we've all been following it with um, great, um, uh, how should I put it, um, uh, anticipation as to what the next act might be. Uh, there was a uh, supposedly a coup recently in uh, Berlin, uh, which um, you know, scared off uh, the uh, uh, Olaf Schultz uh, government. And there was a crackdown which um, affected the entire country. Um, you've done a very interesting piece on this coup uh, uh, in, um, in Dances with Bears. First of all, I'd like to ask you, uh, before we get to Matt uh, on broader international issues, what is the significance of this coup as far as the um, stability of Germany is concerned and what impact might it have on the future of the war in Ukraine with Russia. That's a tall order, Michael. Uh, and uh, as you said, I, I, I report from Russia and from the Russian perspective. So um, domestic German politics, I, I can't claim to be a, a, an expert on, though I do have uh, friends in Germany and, and sources there. Um, there was a coup, but it wasn't the one you mentioned. The coup, in Germany uh, was uh, the attempt, a successful attempt so far by Olaf Scholz's government, uh, including the Green Foreign and, uh, Minister, Baerbock, and the SDP, Socialist Democratic, Social Democratic Party, Interior Ministry Minister, to destroy the only political party currently expressing opposition to Germany's war against Russia and Germany's uh, involvement in the Ukraine. Bear in mind that uh, Mr. Schultz has already declared Germany's readiness to start a billion euro rearmament program. That rearmament program is aimed squarely, directly, and unilaterally at Moscow. That's the beginning of the new stage of what I think we could call the 100 years, second 100 years war in Europe. That's to say the war which began by the European and US allies in 1918, when forces from all of those countries were launched into uh, the Western Russia and into the Eastern Russia, including the Japanese, as you remember, with the aim of destroying the new Bolshevik regime in Moscow and St. Petersburg and reversing the possibility that Russia would become a significantly independent power in Europe. This is the continuation of that war by other means. Now, if Germany has an already committed to a US supplied, US assisted, US based and US occupied rearmament program, that's the beginning of the new stage in which the US fights Russia to the last Ukrainian and will then fight Russia to the last German. This is fundamentally what's happening. Schultz, the weakest German chancellor in living memory is following what Angela Merkel, one of the stronger of the German chancellors in living memory, had already begun. 
as a war against Russia using Ukraine as a gun platform. So just prior to the, um, the uh, so-called uh, putsch plot, uh, the beginning of the repression and destruction of the Alliance for Germany, the AFD in German. As you all know, Angela Merkel gave two interviews to Die Zeit and Die Spiegel, in which she admitted her entire thrust uh, of policy in uh, the Ukraine was to buy time for the Ukrainian uh, forces to be rearmed and re-equipped, financed and so forth, to wage war against Russia. She admitted that the week before the pseudo putsch and the combination of Merkel's admissions of lying and deceit and Schultz's attempt to suppress any form of German criticism of Merkel or himself constitute a new strategic declaration of war in Europe against Russia. But I say declaration of war, I mean continuation of the war uh, that began in 1918 and certainly continued after Hitler was eliminated in 45 uh, and, and so on and so forth. I'd like to get um, uh, Matt into this discussion since, since we're focusing on Germany, a dominant power in Europe, uh, to the convenience or inconvenience of some uh, EU member states. Um, if, I, if I recall correctly, uh, China has been playing um, a very significant uh, influential role in, in Germany. It has uh, purchased, uh, I think, a substantial stake in the, Ham in the port of Hamburg. And uh, it has uh, quite a great deal of commercial sway in Germany. And Olaf Schulz was in China recently. Uh, Matt, uh, since you're our, our man in the Orient, so to speak, how do you see the uh, German and uh, China uh, relationship developing in the future? I think Germany, and, and first of all, let me just say that uh, the, the framing of the recent century, century or a little bit more than a century of history, the way uh, John has just done, as I think the most useful exercise that people are not accustomed to doing, but it's really valuable to recognize that there has been no serious authentic peace since World War I, that we've been in a constant period of tension animated perhaps by moments between World War I, World War II, of what appeared to be peace, but not really. There was a, World War II was really just another chapter or, or, or it, it was really a continuation of the exact same war. And, you know, when you look at the Cold War from the standpoint, the reconstitution of many of the leading Nazi and fascist forces into US and Anglo-American intelligence during the Cold War. I mean, the, the very fact that, that what is it, something like uh, like eight of the leading, um, want, sorry, I got a problem with my camera. Eight of the leading um, chiefs of NATO's Eastern European operations were former Nazi SS operatives up until 1983 is just a sign that World War II itself was not even resolved. The war, you know, these wars to end all wars, never the case. So people should just be aware that there's been an active uh, fascist operation underway that has shaped our lives in ways that many people have not even begun to appreciate. Now, what you've just said about Germany is important because you have two different Germanys. You know, you, ha you have um, an ironical reconstitution of a certain um, operation today in Germany under the helm of Olaf Scholz, even before that with Merkel, uh, unfortunately, who we've now discovered to be much more of a, of a malleable puppet than, than I think we'd hoped she was. Maybe, maybe some of what she said might have been just to accommodate perhaps uh, certain power brokers who wanted her to say certain things. I personally want to think that perhaps that that Merkel really did want Nord Stream 2 and, and even Nord, Nord Stream 1 to, to succeed. I, I don't think she was happy to discover her phone and her uh, office to be tapped by Five Eyes operations. I don't think she was happy with that. Whatever the reason was, she said what she said, it was said. And, um, and so on the one hand, you have this... Um, this one 
future pressing upon Germany, demanding that Germany be effectively um, a colony and a sacrificial colony at that on behalf of higher power structures located in the Anglo-American power bloc that want to see Germany, kind of like the way that they saw Germany when they were building up the Hitler operation back in the 19, even 20s and early 30s, when Prescott Butch was deployed to, to offer millions of dollars of loans to the bankrupt Nazi war machine in 1932, right? You got to keep in mind, Nazism would have collapsed <laughs> in bankruptcy after uh, uh, Kurt von Schleicher had uh, been appointed um, chancellor of Germany. The Nazi, the Nazi party was on their way out. People didn't like them in Germany. And it was only by a lot of artificial um, influence that they were able to reconstitute themselves. Kurt von Schleicher soon found himself dead under the in the in the uh, wake of the Night of the Long Knives and the the inside job of the Reichstag fire. So you know, <clears throat> you had Germany being manipulated back then, just like today. And Germany back then was being set up as potentially a sacrificial lamb in a in a broader great game, just like today. And then you have the middle shine. You have the actual, I think, what I think of as being the more authentic interests of Germany that um, are are looking very much east as being the only point of salvation for themselves and their nation and the industrial base that's been so hollowed out over 50 years. And the port of Duisburg is one of the, the most important strategic ports that is at the end point of the Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, one of the longest rail connections continuously from China. Um, that is something which potentially opens a gateway of massive development and cooperation east-west between Europe and uh, China. But also, you know, Germany has has major, major interests with Russia as well on a variety of fronts that I don't think it's, it's necessary for me to go through. So, you know, you got these two different futures uh, pulling on Germany from two different directions, and only one of them are in the, the interests of the actual German people and the nation itself as, as a sovereign a sovereign entity. Um, unfortunately, under Schultz's regime and, and you know people like Baerbrock and, and others who are ideologically incapable of, I, I think, um, deciding on what is the actual best pro-development, pro you know, uh, policy for for uh, Germany. I don't I don't see much coming out of them, but hopefully there there's something which can see East as as being the future and not this current policy of being um, you know a sacrificial collateral damage under a, a proxy war against Russia or China. Right. So so there you go. We have this shift of Germany uh, becoming practically. Um completely beholden to American interests. And I'd like to shift back to, to John Helmer on this. Um, uh, John, uh, what do you see, uh, how do you see Germany uh, playing uh, its cards in, in the future as far as the war in Ukraine is concerned? Will they uh, be marching in lockstep with Washington? Or do you see a p potential for some sort of, um, um, you know, a divergency and maybe Berlin will, uh, make some lame attempts at um, shifting towards the possibility of um, uh, some sort of peace talks or, you know, truce, uh, um, you know, negotiations, or will they uh, continue to uh, support prolonging the war in Ukraine and supporting the war financially, whatever the cost? And as, as we've seen in Munich, some demonstrations and um, the Germans are getting a little bit fed up with um, you know, having to decide whether to uh, heat their apartments or, uh, you know, um, have their uh, bratwurst uh, and uh, so forth and their sauerkraut. Um, how do you see Germany going forward after this coup, post-coup? Will they shift more towards a, um, a mediator role uh, or in this conflict or are they gonna just follow orders from Washington? Germany doesn't have a mediation role with Russia any longer. It was made clear uh, by Merkel's admissions, just to go back to something important that Matt had said, the reason Merkel supported Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 is entirely for domestic, economic, and electoral reasons. She supported the continuation of 
Nord Stream 2 for as long as the United States and Washington would allow her. Then she allowed continuation but delay without cancellation until she re got herself re-elected in 2015 with a significant swing against her. It was domestic politics that enabled Merkel to support Nord Stream 2 uh, because the business constituencies and the employment constituencies uh, the, on which she depended for her power, depended on it, on the Nord Stream 2. When it was remotely possible for the new successor regime to negotiate what you rightly call, Michael, a mediation or continuation, um, the NATO plan executed by some combination of Poland, uh, the British, the United States, and some of the Scandinavian states, uh, blew Nord Stream 2 and 1 to pieces. So there could be no uh, revival of that um, uh, commercial interest that might induce some elements of the German uh, business community and the trade union vote um, to reconsider their, their position towards Russia. So uh, President Vladimir Putin has made very clear that since Merkel's admissions, um, nothing said, nothing said by a German can be trusted any longer. This was already Russian position towards the United States, particularly Biden, um, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, and his allies. Nothing they say or sign their names to can have any value any longer. Now, this does several things to the, the map uh, of German interest. First of all, um, they have been reluctant to be seen to be committed to the US plan against Russia uh, on the ground in the Ukraine. Uh, they weren't at all reluctant to uh, sign up to the Navalny Novichok uh, fabrication. They weren't at all. Uh, reluctant to sign up to sanctions. So on several on the propaganda arm of the war against Russia, Germany has been extremely active, and their intelligence agencies have, have have been supportive, and their media have been supportive. All of their media. Now, uh, what they are uh, also are now going to find themselves doing is rearming themselves so that they're in a they have the capacity to fight Russia. They don't want to do that anytime soon. And Merkel made very clear that the policy of the chancellery is to buy time. So the German uh, long term is to let as many Ukrainians die first before they're ready to fight. And that's also a US strategy. Now, in the meantime, we have some, some of the smaller states closer to the Russian border that don't like Germany at all. Uh, Poland, Michael, you know very well. And the Polish view of the current strategic situation is to hate Germany and hate Russia with equal fury and seek entire protection under the US umbrella we could go on to talking about your views about the Polish attitude, but let's bear in mind, Germany has a problem with the Polish view. Second, we have uh, Hungary, which doesn't express itself um, as explicitly towards Germany and the United States, Russia or the Ukraine as the Poles do, uh, but Mr. Orban, is pursuing a much more independent role. And Germany cannot, cannot pursue its long-term policy if um, there is significant uh, resistance, not only from Russia, which will dictate the battlefield outcome with Germany as it has done repeatedly before, but if the Hungarians demonstrate independence and if the Poles come round to independence. And then we have, the fights in the Balkans, where Germany has done untold damage, untold damage against Serbia, which won't be forgotten. So, well, we I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned 
Excuse me, I'm glad that you mentioned Serbia, and I'm, I'm now we're shifting to another hotspot uh, in Europe. And um, it's, it's very interesting that you mentioned that because we see tensions between Serbia and Kosovo. And uh, before we sort of, uh, you know, uh, broach that, I'd like to ask you, gentlemen, uh, since we're, I'm of Polish Canadian origin and we sort of, all of us gravitate uh, in or, or around the Anglosphere, uh, I'd like to ask both of you, the United Kingdom is the main, if I may say, battering ram besides Poland in this war against Ukraine, which is somewhat uh, astonishing to me, having studied in, in, the, um, in, in the UK, uh, I saw uh, how uh, Tony Blair um, was very adamant about the um, deposal of um, Slobodan Milosevic in, in 1999. And we are seeing a very um, vehement um, Russophobic attitude on the part of, of, uh, of Britain uh, towards uh, uh, Russia in this war in Ukraine. And I'd like to ask both of you, since we all are in the Anglo-Saxon world, um, why is the United Kingdom so vehemently um, against Russia and supporting the Ukrainian side, more so perhaps than the United States? I'd like to ask um, Matt that question first, then we'll go to John. There's a, a famous quote by Lord Palmerston that, that asserts something to the, to the effect that the empire has no permanent allies, only permanent interests. And, uh, and I think that what he said in the 19th century has as much application today as it did then, um, that anything is disposable. Everything falls or, or is subsumed by the interests of empire. No matter that, that's the way you're looking at the utilitarian worldview of an imperialist is that you know you might have local um, at, at, at certain any given moment you might try to project the idea that one local group a minority group an ethnic group or another group around the world might be uh, your friend but in reality you're you're willing to sacrifice that friend when its uh, use has run out and even Sun Yat-sen the first president of China had even written. Um, it, it, as a warning to his fellow, at this point, he was not in, in power anymore in 1919 at the Treaty of, during the Treaty of Versailles. He said, look, if you, my fellow Chinese patriots, if you, if you give trust to your, uh, to this, this uh, creature in Britain that uh, wants, that says that it's looking out for your best interests, it's going to carve you up and sacrifice you just like a silkworm farmer will excrete silk from the worms and then light them on fire when they have no more silk to excrete. That's what will happen to China if you trust, if you trust the British. Um, and he said this with, with good reason. Um, I, I, think, I think overall we are subject today as we were back in the 19th century and, and as Sun Yat-sen was speaking to a grand strategic strategy, which is not necessarily simply American in some simplistic um, formulation. There, there's something more sophisticated behind the, behind the scenes above the institution of the United States as a national institution, which is located in those older power structures centered in the city of London, in the uh, British Foreign Office, you know, in, in things like MI5, MI6, which have utilized um, a, a variety of techniques to infiltrate and create fifth columns, fifth columnists in various countries that are targeted for um, destruction from within. You know, things like the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, people think, well, yeah, of course, that's a very powerful think tank controlling foreign policy for much of the 20th century since it was created in 1921. Of course, it's a very powerful institution. But is it American? Oh. This thing was created as the, the American branch of the British Royal Institute for International Affairs. As, 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 as this grouping that was, you know, th this was known in, in some circles by people like Carol Quigley and others, an American historian who, who documented this very rigorously as the, the Milner Rhodes Roundtable Movement um, that had branches in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, even in South Africa that had coordinated a foreign policy approach utilizing certain scholarships known as Rhodes Scholarships over many generations that maintained a continuity of intention, of design, which were outlined by Cecil Rhodes back in his wills. 
Um, so, you know, the, this idea that the British Empire just disappeared and gave liberty to its colonies after World War II, and now it's the American Empire, it's a bit of an over, over, oversimplified narrative that we've been fed, which hides the reality of what's really, I think, uh, pushing on, uh, on the system from above. Um, as far as Serbia is concerned, yeah, I mean, Serbia has been... Would you say, would you say that Britain has some, I mean, post-imperial interest in prolonging the war in Ukraine? I mean, how does this apply to today's uh, billions that they're pouring into this lost war? Because it doesn't look like it's a winning war for the West. Uh, does, does I'll, I'll let John, what John is, say what is, something about this, but but all that to say, I, I the way I see it is is that um, Britain, um, as far as like the the actual power structures of the empire, I'm not talking about the British Parliament or the British people or anything of the sort. I'm talking about the actual um, imperial institutions. Um, I I. I I don't see them as having disappeared, and I still I still see them as a very active influence internationally. And um, I think that they, um, along with their their junior partners inside of the United States, are currently doubling down on a program of asymmetrical warfare to try to weaken as much as they can with Russia and also China and, and other um, rivals that they perceive as rivals. In, who represent the emerging multipolar Eurasian alliance, which is currently rejecting their doctrine of a global post-nation post -nation state world order. Um, and so, yes, yeah, Serbia, Kosovo, well, Kosovo specifically, as well as Ukraine are, are, are spark plugs, as well as Armenia and, and Azerbaijan and other, other spark plugs in the heartland of Milner's so, uh, world island. That's how so I see it. So we can say that, uh, John, uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, um, in a transition to what Matt was saying, uh, do you see Britain getting some sort of advantage, geopolitical advantage, or or some sort of um, you know payback from the Americans in opposing the uh, Russian-Chinese sort of uh, alliance, which was, is becoming uh, quite a big threat to the West? Is, is is that their main motivation in supporting the Kiev regime? Well, yes. But with the following, with the qualification, uh, Michael, that the British power structures to which Matt referred, and I agree, have different interests from the British people, from British business, and the city of London, and the law courts, and so on. Um, what I see, uh, and better, I try to describe this from the, Rus from the Russian perspective as distinct from my own. From a Russian perspective, Great Britain is a joke. It's near, uh, it's, a, it's in self-destruction and it, its weakness is unprecedented in British, modern British history. N never has either the sovereign or the, uh, and I include Buckingham Palace, or the British government being as weak, as incompetent, uh, serially, as we now find. Now, um, that means that the underlying, let's call it deep state, to use the US term, uh, has to uh, protect and conserve its interests and its interests have uh, been to uh, are militarily uh, insignificant in the Ukraine war, insignificant on any battlefield. That basically the British are now a Spetsnaz contributor to a US run battlefield operation. Spetsnaz, special forces, commandos. Um, uh, deception operations on the battlefield and so on. They are no longer. They can run a uh, the US, The Royal Navy can run a destroyer towards Crimea. But the minute the Russian warning was, "We open fire if you don't uh, change course," they change course. That's the extent of the Royal Navy. Uh, it's symbolic of the Royal Navy. Uh, what the the British specialize in is the English language. And in the English language, propaganda for this war, Russia hating, demonizing 
uh, the president of Russia uh, developing narratives that are fake, false flag uh, uh, narratives like the Novichok narrative, which began with the uh, Whitehall uh, operation involving the Skripals in, in 2000. And 18, as you know, this is the Russian, uh, the British specialty deception operation in the form of propaganda. Britain, as a as a as a factor of force in this war in the future of Europe, is finished. Second, as a uh, as a factor of economic power, it's equally finished. But they're doing that to themselves. The sanctions which the British have signed on to, reversing uh, half a generation of cultivation of Russian capital and channeling a trillion dollars worth of Russian capital export through the city of London, through the law courts, through the law firms, through the accountancy firms, through the stock exchange, the commodities exchange, all of that has now been sacrificed because the US sanctions program has required it and the British have uh, complied. A combination of Brexit and sanctions have destroyed or are in the process of destroying um, British capability as a significant economic force. And everything you see and read uh, indicates a compliance by whoever's in occupation in Downing Street uh, to the disadvantage of British capital. Now, what that leaves is a combination of um, special forces operations on the ground and propaganda operations, which are diversified through Murdoch's newspapers, in fact, every London newspaper, through the universities, which have become think tank, uh, government finance propaganda organs, and all of the combinations of think tank, university, uh, Royal, uh, Chatham House, the Royal Institute, and others to mobilize public opinion through the English language. Now, propaganda looks forceful, and it's a very important factor in uh, prolonging the war, with, with the fantasy that the war is being won in the Ukraine. Pick up any British paper, the Financial Times, the London Times, you name it, they're all now the same. This propaganda force moves across the Atlantic where the British believe they're smarter than the Americans. They always did that. They thought they conned and gulled the Americans into World War II when FDR wasn't so keen on it, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to repeat the story, but Matt has retold the story many times and very effectively. My view is um, that the Russian interpretation of the British as masters of a propaganda also downplays the long-term significance of the British. Instead, what you, uh, and in the future of Europe, the British have divorced themselves by Brexit. So a combination of the two uh, put the kibosh, not a British term, I suppose, uh, on the um, British capability to, to exercise power independently in Europe. Therefore, um, the British deep state must have, must preserve its alliance with the United States. In every deep state uh, program, you will find a, an Anglo-American partnership, whether it's to develop Novichok at Port and Down, which uh, the Pentagon has been helping uh, the British to develop for many years, or whether it's to develop um, uh, dirty bomb torpedoes that would go up the, uh, up the river against uh, Russian targets in the Ukraine. What, whatever the operation is, you will find an Anglo-American partnership in which the British try to preserve their um, strategic role. In fact, it's a tactical role, a tactical role. Propaganda, however, in the English language, does tend to be uh, far more significant. Um, uh, and at that point, the British punch above their weight. But the Russians don't take that seriously. Seriously, 
is force on the battlefield and money, not propaganda, not words, sticks and stones, not break bones. Words ultimately don't hurt. The, that leaves the British playing a very minor role in the future. Well, thank you for that uh, very succinct summary of the uh, UK's role in this in this war. And uh, I'd like, uh, Matt, uh, as we sort of um, come to the conclusion of our uh, three-way, three uh, trilateral, if I may say, discussion, uh, would you like to add anything to that, uh, Matt? I, I absolutely endorse uh, the, the framing of, of the topic that, that John just relayed. And I, I think that it's so important to differentiate the um, where, where it is that this, that this empire, um, where it believes to be effective is, and where it is effective, where the empire is very effective is in the domain of perception management. Fine. Okay, they're victorious in the domain of perception management. Is but that the a, domain a code of word reality... for propaganda? Is that a bit a bit of like a propaganda uh, technique that the British have uh, mastered in in, in international they're relations? <laughs> they're very good at making good puppets that you that will convince people that they're almost real. That they are real. They're, they're shadow masters. They're they're perfect at shadows and getting people to believe in shadows. The reality, however, is where they fail. Um, and I, I, I do appreciate the fact that uh, John was able to illustrate that tactical and strategic differentiation that when it comes to actual action, practicality, um, as we see in the case of Ukraine or in the case of Bashar al-Assad will certainly fall any day now back in, you know, I'm, I'm speaking now in 2014, <laughs> any day now, um, there, there is a complete disassociation from the reality that is reality. And, and so there is, I think, a certain arrogance, which is to the benefit of actual humans who want to have a future when you, when you appreciate the, the structural in, in systemic arrogance of empire which begins to believe their own propaganda. They want to project victory or a victorious um, image onto the, the world. But the reality is that they fail systemically every single time. And then, they, but the problem is that they believe their own propaganda. And so they double down, triple down, quadruple down on the things that they've been doing and that have continuously failed every single time. As again, we see with the absurdity of policy regarding their approach to Ukraine, their approach to, um, I mean, pretty much every strategic battlefront you can imagine. Just look at what China has been able to do with Russia in the in Southwest Asia, and especially with the Gulf states now who have all decided to veer east. Turkey is increasingly looking east because, I mean, even Saudi Arabia, Turkey are, are all realizing that they are not as indispensable as they, they, as they were promised they were by their patrons um, in the West, who and they've all come to realize that within the broader great game, they're all disposable um, tools to be to be thrown away at or to be flushed when they're no longer useful. And so China and, and Russia and, and Iran and other countries are basically arranging a new alternative way of thinking about economics, security, um, which actually entails an authentic interest for for them to survive and to thrive in a world that is being built in the ashes of the current smoldering economic order, which is coming down around, unfortunately, our ears here in the transatlantic five eyes dominated, dominated West. Hopefully, my, my prayers are that there are a, a, enough um, people and maybe even people within corridors of power who, when, when the fire gets to the point of being something you cannot any longer ignore, will recognize that their actual interest is located in avoiding World War III and in working to build uh, energy and other vital infrastructure with allies in Eurasia that want to av also avoid war and want to create real abundance instead of adapting to scarcity as some other forces would like to do. So I do hope that as the crisis deepens that we can also uh, look east as well. Um, in Canada, unfortunately, I don't see too many domains or, or opportunities at this moment to, to do that, but those have to be created. So that, that's my, my take on, on that at this moment. 
Gentlemen, uh, we'll pursue this. We didn't get into the hotspot of the, um, the Balkans and the shift from mm -hmm. uh, uh, the west to the east, but uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour. And I want to thank you both uh, for casting a cold eye, uh, but a very uh, accurate um, we, uh, assessment of the geopolitical uh, events that are occurring uh, uh, around the world. I want to thank uh, Matt Errett and John Helmer for this uh, trilateral discussion on world affairs. And I want to thank our viewers and listeners for being part of this podcast. Uh, we'll see you again on Worldview for our next uh, segment. Thank you all for joining us and goodbye. Thank you.